So um, I think we'll make a start. I know people have got um, lots of other things to do this afternoon, so um, we'll make a start. And then if people join, then um, I'm sure they will uh, just bed in nicely. Um, so welcome, everybody. My name is Ellen Goodwin. I'm leading on all things clean growth at New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, this is the last of our webinars. Um, so we've had uh, this is the sixth and final one um, related to COP27, as COP27 is now coming to an end in Sharm El Sheikh. And these are all being funded by the UK government's uh, I was going to say share prosperity fund. That's not true. Community renewal fund. Uh, and we've welcomed uh, Connor as one of our um, net zero consultants to come and deliver this webinar on understanding supply chain emissions and ESG readiness, which is very broad. There's lots of good content in here and Connor's going to uh, get through as much of it as he can in the hour. So I will pass over to you, Connor. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, my name is Conor Enright. I'm from EP Group or EP Consultancy, um, and we run a, a wide range of consultancy activities, including um, <coughs> individual assistance for, for businesses and um, all the way up to kind of technical due diligence for larger projects. Um, and so <coughs> we work kind of across the spectrum and, and a key part of that and increasingly more and more within our engagements is supply chain and, and scope three emissions. Um, and a lot of the strategic drivers behind those are actually what we call these ESG elements. Uh, and we'll get into what we really mean by that in a second. Uh, there's quite a lot of content here, um, and I'll try not to speak too quickly at you. But if there is anything that you'd like just to hold for a second or, or discuss, if you've got any questions, just stick your hand up or, or say something. Um, and we can pause there and um, cover that. Um, <clears throat> apologies as well for any, any uh, coughing or spluttering just on, on the recovery from COVID. Um, but I'll start with, as I always do with it, with a bit of a legal disclaimer, that even though we're talking about things that involve money and money trading hands, uh, this is not personal financial advice. Um, the other aspect to say here is that you do have to be careful when you're talking about ESG elements and uh, anything to do with the kind of trading or, or reporting or accounting of emissions, um, because people can look at it more carefully and it can be quite a complex topic. Um, so if you are unsure at all about whether you're reporting something correctly, the best place to go is, is the GHDG or Greenhouse Gas Protocol .org, uh, And that's run by the, the uh, World Resources Institute, if I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. And that speaks on how you can, as a, a, a company or an individual, best uh, account for and, and report and communicate your uh, carbon emissions and, and progress in reducing those. But first, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a look of the, what we mean when we say ESG. And uh, apologies, there are a lot of uh, TLAs or three-letter acronyms throughout this slideshow and this topic generally. So I'll do my best to break them down and, and to give you some examples as we go. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. It's basically anything that's beneficial that isn't to do with making money effectively, um, but often the elements that a business does which are positive are divided into two parts. The first thing is money making and finance and all of that stuff. And ESG is basically everything else that doesn't fit within that. So we've given, got some examples here, you know, it, environmental is, is fairly obvious. It's your impact on environmental quality. And the two key crises that that, that often fits with are, are, are the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, which are very much interlinked and, and require wider scale system change. Uh, but there are some other environmental impacts that, that might not be considered. Those things include things like noise and light pollution, uh, your, out, your outcomes in terms of air quality and how that affects local air quality, um, water, and any other form of pollution. Um, it's often also described as, as natural capital, which is basically um, anything from the natural world uh, which has value which is pretty much everything, but again, it, it depends where you kind of draw that boundary around what you call valuable or otherwise. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, within that, I've also got a social element. So um, here we describe that as your impact on society and your, your wider stakeholders. Um, and that can be the community that you operate in, or it can be a bit further afield. Um, and those communities don't have to just be the public. They can also include uh, businesses and other institutions um, that, that form part of the kind of social fabric. Um, again, we use kind of the words capital here. So people talk about human capital. And really that means things like um, skills, the ability um, for your employees and, and the wider public to, to pay for things and uh, to support a good standard of living and equitable outcomes. So, you know, how fair are things? Are, are people able to achieve um, what they want to? 
um, and and is this supporting what we'd consider a fair and just society? Um, often, really, when we're talking about this, we're talking about things within your supply chain, particularly if you've got links to developing economies uh, where environmental and labour standards may be weaker. Um, you need to kind of draw a, a wider bubble around your social impact um, and start to think about it as broadly as you can, particularly if you're a larger company or a company with, with high levels of scrutiny. Um, finally, we've got stuff around governance, and that's basically very interlinked with the first two, the E uh, and the S. And this is about how your company is managed and led around what kind of incentives there are, um, what kind of controls there are, and, and what kind of transparency and accountability is embedded. And often the reason why we talk about governance is because we want to encourage positive environmental and social outcomes. Um, and this is the most effective way to get there. Fantastic. So I'll keep going with the glossary section. Um, and this is one from the academic literature that isn't spoken about just uh, as much in, in the wider uh, conversation, but I think it's just important. And it's referred to generally as CSR. And as academics do, they, they've actually split this into two very, very similar, but slightly different uh, sets of terms. And those are corporate social responsibility and corporate social responsiveness, sometimes called CSR1 and CSR2, and it's all very confusing. But the point here is that corporate, corporate social responsibility is quite a paternalistic um, and in some ways a bit, bit of an old fashioned concept where it's assumed that the corporation knows best and that they are a responsible corporation. And from their position of power, um, the should then be able to decide how to address what society thinks that they should have. Um, and so you define a set of responsibilities and then the company just has to attempt to meet those in the public's interest. However, in, in recent years, it's, it's become recognized that actually that there are different parts of society that want different things and that those different things change actually quite quickly with the media and, and with our understanding of things like climate change. And that's where this new definition comes in, which is corporate social responsiveness. And really, that puts the, the public first. It puts them in the position of power. And it says that we, we have to expect public opinions to change over time. And as companies, what we need to do is, is listen to that and respond to that. So that's all about, um, you know, creating a more even power structure between uh, the public and the company and putting in place processes that allow you to engage and understand with the, uh, the wider public and what they expect of you and al allow you to integrate those into your kind of business as usual approach um, in such a way that actually it's a discussion rather than a kind of top down, you know, this is what we think you want and here's how we're going to give it to you. Fantastic. But who cares? Why, why are we talking about this in the first place? Um, here we've got a range of, of actors from a, across your, your sector and with your impact there at the bottom. Um, and so you can see that, you know, we've got industry actors, we've got public um, and we, I, call, I say publics because there are different parts of the, 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 the general public that want different things. Um, we have governments at various scales, from local authorities to the central government uh, and intergovernmental organisations like the COPs. Um, and then we have investors. And so within those different broad categories, we've got specific actors that really will look at your ESG and, and your corporate social responsiveness, and they will interrogate it and and that will cause an impact both on them and, and upon your business. So that can be suppliers and customers. Employees are often given an example. Um, another thing that really drives change is, is compliance and regulatory bodies and the rules that they set. But equally, judicial systems within the UK are actually responsible for making up a, a, a large amount of our legal framework. Um, and so how uh, judges and judicial systems understand what your business does and its responsibilities and responsiveness will be key uh, for larger scale issues. And then we've got other things like, excuse me, public funders, auditors and risk assessors, which will give you an idea around what, what finance you can access and what costs come with that. Uh, the key thing here to say is that the public is smart um, and actors in your industry are also very smart and very likely to share your expertise. Um, think people like investors are risk assessment experts and all of these policies and all of these perspectives flow through into a, a governmental and policy perspective. So there really is nowhere that you can hide from ESG expectations. And in the long run, these actors can and will make or break your business, depending on um, how responsive it is and, and how well it's embodied ESG um, <clears throat> impacts and benefits in its um, business case. 
However, there is a question around what's in it for you. Uh, and this is not about charity. Um, it's about good business. So really, you need to think about um, this in terms of how do you manage risks and how do you support your strategic objectives? And now, these strategic objectives will vary from business uh, to business. You can focus on what you want and, and how ESG can get you there. So if you're a business to business sector, it might be around things like operational efficiency, first and foremost. So if you're thinking about, you know, environmental efficiency gains, such as, you know, energy conservation, um, complying with new carbon regulations, um, then you might actually find that things like operational efficiency, you know, quicker processes, lower energy intensity in your processes, um, and effective governance, you know, it, it retaining employees, having good quality monitoring and assurance, these are all interlinked. And so you can use one to drive forward the things that your, your business really cares about namely things like operational efficiency and, and uh, things like employee retention. And the same can be said for risks. These vary over time, which is why we need to be responsive. And they also vary between sectors. And so your business should already be monitoring and managing its risk. And um, so integrating ESG into those processes just gives you a better view of all of that. Um, when you're thinking about relevant risks for ESG consideration, um, it's going to be things like market risk. So, you know, your exposure to, to changes in energy prices, reputational risk. You know, uh, what if someone writes a, an article about your carbon emissions and how they're either good or bad for the environment and uh, things like, excuse me, compliance risk. You know, um, are you going to get a fine from the regulator for not improving your carbon emissions? And then there's also aspects around, you know, how do you... Um, model things? How do you think about how your business is going to change in the future? And, and how do you report things like um, climate change impacts and, and carbon abatements as well? So there's a wide range of risks. The key aspect is that these all should be integrated as part of running a, a sustainable and, and effective business. Excuse me. So we've spoken a little bit about um, what ESG is, but we need some examples of, of how we can actually start to get involved and in, in to improve these aspects. So whilst I try not to cough my lens up, I'll, I'll give you a second to look at, at what we have on the screen here and some different examples from the environmental, the social and the governance, from the obvious stuff like um, getting rid of your greenhouse gas emissions, all the way through to things like assigning accountability for ESG within, within your organisation. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, you can start to think about these things in terms of kind of natural and, and human capital. So things like, you know, clean water, having healthy ecosystems near you, having um, clean air to breathe and, and, and good nature around you. These are all things that we value um, and that we need to support. And it's the same thing with developing skills and, and having a fair and uh, just society. These are all things that, that the public and ourselves value. And so it's how can we support those through the work that we do. Often the reason why people do these things is, is, is less to do with um, targeting a specific aspect, but actually to do with how they're going to speak about their action afterwards. Um, and so we've got some examples here on the screen, one thing to bear in mind throughout whatever kind of ESG action you're trying to take is how do we speak about it? Um, there's a fair amount of information on, on the screen here, so I'll, I'll just whiz through it. But the thing to say is that you need to take a lot of care when you're reporting your, your ESG impacts um, because reporting or, or, or misreporting your ESG action can present a, a significant risk to your business particularly if that reporting is done through a publicly available platform or a platform that, that will be reviewed by your stakeholders, your investors, for example. Um, so platforms like the Carbon Disclosure Project, the whole idea is that when you report there, um, people will come and look at your reporting and, and form a positive or a negative opinion on that. And often that's driven by, by investors. Um, so you, whenever you're reporting your action, you have to bear in mind that it, it could be helpful, um, but likewise, that someone could come and disagree with what you've said or, or how you've measured it. Um, and so you need to have really good connection between the project staff that are completing projects that improve your environmental, social and governance impacts and the communicators that actually take those and, and turn them into impact reports and, and uh, expose them to the wider, the wider market. And throughout this, you need to consider your audience. You know, if you're if you're talking to investors, 
Um, you're going to be wanting to talk about how this improves your business, how it makes it more sustainable, saves money and, and reduces risk, which is what investors ultimately care about. If you're talking to the, the public, telling them about profitability can actually make you look worse <laughs> rather than better. And so you might have to focus on different aspects and really think about what your audience there cares about. And this goes back to this concept of, of responsiveness. There is a, there's no single audience that cares about one single thing. You need to think about what they um, are engaged with, what they're emotional about, and, and start to pick out the positive aspects from there. Um, but there are four things that we really need to consider when we're talking about reporting our action um, and how good you are as a business. Uh, the first is accuracy. So whenever you say something, you have to be able to say um, that this has been measured or verified, or if it hasn't been measured and verified, be very upfront about that. Um, but ideally, you only really want to report verifiable aspects um, or, or when you're summarizing aspects, only take the things that are, are proven um, to be your final impact. Equally, um, you need to think a little bit about representation. You know, who, who is this really serving? Is it actually helping stakeholders and the public to hold you to account? You know, I've read a lot of impact reports um, that, that just speak about the positive. Um, and, you know, as, as someone who's conducting due diligence on that, that, that can start to raise alarm bells quite quickly because really what we want is, is a holistic perspective. And, and if you're speaking to a, an audience that is very knowledgeable and has a lot of expertise in what you're talking about, um, then it, it, it can be quite clear to them that your report is serving you and, and not them at that point. Um, the same can be said about selectiveness. So, you know, even though we want to put our, our best foot forward, you need to have some, some conversation around the negative impacts when you're reporting. Um, you need to be quite rigorous about this. So perhaps define a scope about what you're going to talk about or not talk about at the start of your, your impact or um, reporting process or, or your process to improve your ESG aspects um, and then focus on that and, and be very consistent about that. Um, a lot, in a lot of ways, actually, a, a business that can recognize its weaknesses will be valued just as much as, a, a if not more, than a business that sweeps them under the rug. Um, Finally, it's interpretability. And this is a, a key issue in the, the kind of scientific and technical worlds, um, because a lot of these reports are written in a way that's not accessible to the everyday people that might own shares in that business or might be a customer down the line. Um, and so really often, often people try and mask their uh, uh, outcomes behind quite complex jargon. Um, so have an idea about thinking about how you can help the wider public and the media to interpret your action, particularly if you have visibility within those fields. And sometimes it's use useful to do two versions of an impact report, one that sits on your website for investors or, or, or goes out as part of the um, shareholder conversations, um, and another that, that actually is a pamphlet or, or something that is, is more public facing and is more accessible. Um, and again, this is where things like having really good connections between technical staff and communicators and consideration of your audience comes in. Fantastic. I'm just going to pause for a second there to have a sip of water uh, and to give you an opportunity to raise your hand if you want to cover um, any of those aspects that we just discussed around what is ESG, um, what is corporate social responsiveness and, and um, how we report those. Okay, fantastic. Stunned silence. What well, <clears throat> can only go up from here. Um, so the reason why we talk about things like uh, uh, interpretability um, and um, thinking really carefully about reporting um, is, is this concept of information asymmetry, uh, which is basically, and I, I did just say that things should be accessible and not use jargon, but that's basically people knowing more than other people about specific topics. Um, so we know that information is, is not evenly distributed, uh, but also we know that people are not stupid. Um, and I think that that latter aspect is, is sometimes forgotten within technical realms. People think that they can get away with hiding behind complex jargon. But it's really important to remember that information asymmetry can both help and hurt your business. Um, so the examples that I give are, you know, information asymmetry in a, in a classic sense is all about marketing. You know, you have a product that's very positive. The uh, wider public doesn't know how positive and useful your product is. And so you want to address that information, information asymmetry by running a marketing campaign and telling them how great it is 
and then you get some really positive impact out of that, um, that information asymmetry is, is addressed. But equally, there might be some things that aren't so great about your product or aren't so great about your business that the public doesn't know. Um, perhaps it doesn't know that, you know, you actually burn some of the rubbish in the back when no one's looking. Um, then that's where we've got the, the other side of the coin, which is, you know, things like leaking or whistleblowing. Um, we're actually members of staff or someone who's got a closer connection to your business and is on the, the other side of that information asymmetry. They know what's happening and they know why it's bad. They go out to the public and they, they expose that and they tell them what's been done and, and why that's bad and why they should care about that. Um, and then all of a sudden, an aspect that you weren't being held accountable to up to that point, you're now being held accountable for. And that's why it goes back to this concept of, of responsibility versus responsiveness. You know, if you're if you're got a fixed idea of what the the public wants, then it's quite easy to justify not telling them uh, things around that. It's you know the, the 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 business equivalent of your your parents telling you that your dog's gone to live on a farm. Um, whereas if you're actually listening to the public and responding to them, then you can kind of get ahead of what the their concerns will be, and you'll start to realise when they it, it's a helpful for accountability and transparency. Uh, purposes for them to know something and to be engaged in that conversation um, versus when it's not relevant, perhaps. Um, and again, so consider your audience throughout this. Remember that, that people aren't st stupid. They have the ability to understand and they have the, um, the right to interrogate your impact and, and how it's reported. Um, and so I've just got some graphs at the bottom there that, that show, again, how you know one concept is about the business knowing best and the public is simply there to, to highlight when the company has failed those responsibilities and is there to, to wait and ask for change. In the other concept, the, the business has expertise, but actually needs the, the help of the wider public to um, direct responsiveness and to direct improvement, because that's what this is all about. It's all about becoming better businesses with, with better impacts on, um, on, on society and the world we live in. And um, so the public can then highlight when the company has failed to meet its expectations and demand change, but they're also drawn in then as stakeholders and they can uh, kind of represent and translate public expectations within that business to, to bring about systematic change. Um, and so throughout all of this, think about, you know, are there people, are there local representatives that, that can play that role of representing and translating on behalf of, of you know, a, a more general group of stakeholders and how can you use their their knowledge and their expertise um, to actually help your business improve in a way that other businesses your competitors might not be doing um, and in the end it, it really needs to to better outcomes for both you and and the, the other stakeholders within your business and your supply chain so now we've gone off the esg bit so if, if you do have any questions about ESG, stick them in the chat and we'll come back to them later or, or stick your hand up and make a note of them. Um, and now we're just going to talk a little bit about emissions. Um, so when we think about uh, ESG impact, environmental impacts are becoming a lot more important. Um, and climate change is, is chief among those. Um, <clears throat> now, when we talk about climate change uh, as a business, you're, you have um, your emissions, and those are usually divided into, into three categories or three scopes. And the reason that this is done is, is, is partly to assign um, where this has come from and, and to account for them so that we aren't double counting these things. But it's also about assigning who has a degree of control over those. Um, so, you know, um, if I go to buy a car and all the cars are petrol, um, in some ways, I have a degree of control over that because I can go out and ride a bike. But in other ways, you know, if I'm leasing a car uh, and the only petrol, uh, the only cars that they offer are petrol cars, then that's less so in my control. Um, and therefore, some of those emissions uh, that are my scope three emissions might be considered someone else's scope one and two emissions. And a lot of uh, attention has been dedicated to those scope one and two emissions because they're quite simple. It's all about what electricity you purchase and what fuels you burn. Um, whereas scope three is everything else. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about here is, is scope three. Um, but just for any confusion, uh, scope one is effectively the fuels that you burn and the direct processes. So if you go and make a load of cement, 
um, and turn calcium carbonate into calcium oxide. You release a load of uh, carbon dioxide, and that's the scope one direct. Um, you know, my company puts this straight into the atmosphere emissions. <laughs> scope two is is effectively the same, but when you've bought it instead of uh, burnt it yourself. Um, so that's any form of energy that's that's stored or transmissible. So not just electricity, but also things like steam, heat, and cooling. Uh, and nowadays there are new energy vectors um, or, or fuels like uh, hydrogen, which might also fit into there. And then scope three is is everything else, basically. Um, so other emissions resulting from the activities of the company where the sources that aren't directly owned or controlled by your business. So that's, for example, if I get uh, the Amazon delivery man to do my deliveries, I don't own Amazon, um, but I am paying them to provide a service and that service produces emissions. Therefore, uh, their scope one emissions come from that van, but they're also my scope three emissions. And so that's where you get that overlap between businesses. And that's where you get this ability to use one emissions, uh, one business's emissions within a supply chain to, to drive forward um, improvements across that whole supply chain. Um, so we'll speak about that in a second. I'll just give you some really quick examples around how you can address your scope one and scope two emissions first. So scope one is very simple. Um, effectively, it's it's burn something else. Um, so perhaps straw, left waste straw instead of coal to, to heat your steam. Um, burn less. So uh, put it all into a, a more efficient boiler and get more heat out of your straw um, or, or your coal or whatever. Um, and then finally, the more complex stuff. So that this is for, for businesses that, that run chemical processes, basically. So that's displacing or replacing those uh, processes. So instead of using calcium carbonate, we use something like a, a magnesium cement to produce uh, concrete, and that has no or, or lower um, emissions. Um, there's also things like uh, just completely, when I talk about fuel switches, um, they're also renewable uh, fuels or energy vectors. So if I need to heat hot water for my home, I don't have to have a gas boiler. I could have a solar thermal system that where the sun heats up water and that's stored. Um, so that you know, with with the um, the advent of new renewable technologies, there are a lot more options around scope one. Um, scope two is very similar. Again, we want to do stuff like burn less, even if we're purchasing this as electricity or or or, or some other energy vector. We want to consume less of it. Uh, we can also use um, some, something called a power purchase agreement um, or a, a supplier switching to purchase energy from renewable sources themselves. This gets onto this third more complicated point, which is make sure that when you are purchasing from <laughs> a supplier uh, that is uh, is green, make sure you know what is driving that greenness. Um, because a lot of electricity, the low carbon attributes are now actually separated from the kilowatt hours units of electricity itself through a, a something called energy attribute certificates in the uk they're known as regos or, or renewable energy guarantees of origin and that's basically a piece of paper that says that one kilowatt hour of renewable energy was produced by a wind turbine or a solar pv or or whatever and so those attributes are often sold separately to the power that you're consuming so even if you're consuming power at home, where 40% of it comes from a, a coal uh, plant, if your power supply company has purchased enough of those energy attribute certificates, then they will take that coal power and they'll make it look green, which is great because at some point, some green electricity has been generated. The issue there is that when those certificates um, are purchased, they're purchased for almost nothing. And so almost no new renewable generation is, is built. The way that renewable generation is paid for is by the general taxpayer uh, and the re renewable energy levy, which everyone pays. So when you're buying that greenness, it's not being paid for with your money. It's being paid for with the general taxpayer's money. And that's why we start to talk about why you have to be really careful with reporting. Because if you go to the CDP or, or, or go to your impact report and say, all of our energy is 100% renewable and it only costs us an extra three pounds a year. Well, it doesn't cost three pounds a year more to generate your renewable energy. Um, and so actually you haven't generated any, any additional benefit for the public. And so when you claim that benefit, you're effectively claiming something that everyone has paid for as just being your impact. Um, and so if I was Joe Bloggs, 
the public who's been paying a higher energy bill as a result, I get quite irritated if you say that that's all your impact when actually only a very small proportion of it is. Um, so this is where you need to take a little bit of care and, and these uh, regos are a key issue in the industry currently. Um, and if you're buying 100% green renewable energy, you'll, they will probably be playing a role. Um, there are some better and worse suppliers um, that, that invest more directly into renewable generation, but it's a very complex uh, topic whenever we're accounting for emissions. And so you just need to take a lot of, a lot of care. And if you don't understand it, perhaps um, reach out to a, a, a facilitation service like New Anglia LEP um, or a consultancy to get some uh, advice. Often that can just be done by email. Okay, enough about that rant. Uh, the other thing you can do is, is switch uh, what, what is powering your process. Um, so for example, um, electrify your, your central heating instead of burning gas, um, and that will reduce some of the emissions. But what we're really here to talk about is scope three emissions. Um, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. And some of these resources um, I have up on the screen will be more useful if you um, get a copy of the slides or, or screenshot them and have a look at them afterwards. Um, but I'll just whiz through some of the things that we can do around scope three. The first thing, and, and this is key, is, is to understand what's coming from where within your supply chain. So um, often you'll have some idea of, of you know, how many miles your uh, 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 transport vehicles drive um, and what the emissions from that will be because the, the government publishes statistics about those. Um, but for other stuff like, you know, how many tons of carbon are in this pallet full of steel um, that I've got to build something, that's much more difficult to tell. And that's where you need to start conversations with your upstream and downstream suppliers um, or customers around where their emissions exist, what they are and, and how they could potentially be improved. The next point is, is map and address practices. And this is how I like to think about behavior. So instead of your employees having behaviors like uh, driving to work, there is a practice of commuting and that has different elements which you can engage with. Um, so you can perhaps change some of the, the skills involved. So you can teach your um, employees how to cycle more safely on busy roads. Uh, you could give them a discounted bike scheme, so give them some stuff. Um, and then you could tell them that cycling to work is a good thing. Um, so give them some additional significance or some more meaning around that. Um, so looking at, at behavior through a, a practice lens gives you lots of different approaches um, to improve those aspects. Um, and that will give you an understanding of, of what practices within your business um, drive emissions and, and what could actually be part of the solution to help those. From here, we've got some more practical stuff uh, like switching suppliers. It's one of the easiest things you can do. Find out who's got a lower carbon footprint, buy from them, and their lower carbon footprint becomes your lower carbon footprint in that, that less carbon is embedded in your final product. Um, you can also fund external projects within your supply chain. So you could um, take that steel manufacturer and say, if I um, you know, pay for you to make your process cleaner. Um, can I have some of those emissions um, impacts? And can I claim those as my own? You also have a role yourself if you're selling products um, to, to support downstream emissions reductions. So that could be really simple things like having stock take back or recycling schemes, um, even through just to having, you know, lower carbon packaging, packaging that, that isn't made of plastic or, or, or can be recycled. Um, and a lot of these things are very difficult to, to, to develop a business case for if you don't have an internal cost of carbon. And the, the way that I like to think about that is, you know, if I am Shell and I produce a load of carbon and everyone dislikes me because of that, I've got to do something about it. Now, I could produce less carbon or I could go out and run a fancy marketing campaign. Um, and so somewhere in between those two things is the amount that you have to pay in order to, to mitigate the impact of, of your emissions. So you can mitigate the impact by just not emitting, uh, but also you can mitigate your impact by making everyone feel slightly better about you and hopefully forgetting it in the end. Um, so setting an internal cost of carbon can help you to, to design projects that are more cost effective for your business than having to go out to the public and apologize and make yourself look better at the end of the day. Um, and that cost of carbon will often be the thing that, that drives forward 
um, your, your improvements internally. The other thing to say is that there is a real cost of carbon if you uh, are a, a big emitter, um, and there are various approaches towards valuing carbon from um, trading your, your emissions and actually generating revenue from those to, to actually having penalties and fines levied on you if you don't take action. But where do we take action? Um, this is a, 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 well, a, a generic map of a business cycle. So you've got a, a product, maybe it's a, a pencil sharpener. At some point, I've got to design that and I've got to go to the factory and say, can you make it out of metal? Um, I've then got to cure or purchase those aspects. So I've got to hire some people who know how to make stuff, I've got to buy some metal, uh, I've got to pay the people in the factory and I've got to get it shipped to me with lots of stuff in between. We then got all that procurement and manufacturing activity itself. Uh, it's got to be packaged. It's got to be shipped and delivered. And then at the end of that, we've got to have customer support and sales. And that includes things like the, the end of life stuff, what happens to the product when it's finished. Um, so you can see here on the screen that some of these are crossed out. Those things that are crossed out are your scope one and two emissions. So when you look at all these different bits and, and where they arise, and, and some of them are repeated, you can see clearly that actually almost all of your emissions uh, in terms of little fiddly things and, and individual sources will come from your scope three category. Um, and supply chain emissions come into every part of the, the, the business cycle. Um, and so having a view of, of what these are and perhaps going through systematically through your process and looking at things like human resourcing and, and IT and software and packaging at every stage will help you to get a, a, an idea of all of your emissions and, and to form what we call emissions inventory, which is a list of where all the emissions come from. Um, and from that, you can work out what you can do about them. So we can now talk about what we can do about them. Um, so the first approach that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail is what we call carbon insetting. Now, this is a form of an offset. So that's where instead of me doing something myself, I pay someone else to do it on behalf, uh, on my behalf. Um, they create a positive impact using my money. And because I paid for it, I claim that as, as being mine. Um, so with everything that's an offset, um, verifiabil uh, verifiability is key. Um, so really, you need to find verifiable emissions abatements, preferably within your supply chain. And as I say, in return for allowing your business to, to appropriate or to claim these emissions, um, your business will have to, to fund the intervention that delivers them partially or in full. Um, so that could be shared. It could be split 50-50. Uh, but that should be defined as part of the kind of funding schedule or the contract. The real advantage here is that carbon insetting makes your product and its related supply chain more sustainable directly. So not only have you paid Joe Bog Steel to, to emit 10 tons less carbon each year, four of those tons were in your pencil sharpeners to begin with. So now when you sell them, they're actually a, a lower carbon product than they would have been otherwise. And all your other mates selling pencil sharpeners are now at a competitive disadvantage. Um, and at the same time, you get to claim some of that uh, uh, impact in terms of other people's steel for yourself. Um, so it's really best targeted at supply chain actors with the highest carbon intensity. Um, often that might be things like heavy industry, but also some of the ones that the, the supply chain um, emissions sources that are difficult to address, so things like logistics and shipping, um, and getting a really good understanding of where those emissions are within your product and its supply chain will really help, but also getting an idea of where existing projects are, because um, then you can fund the ones that are most cost effective and, and get the most bang for your buck. Um, another way that you can do this quite easily to identify where, where best to invest is something called an, a marginal abatement cost curve. Um, which is a really fancy way of saying how much would it cost for me to reduce a little bit less carbon in various uh, sources. Um, so, you know, the, the first 10 tons of, of steel decarbonization might be very cheap. And from there, it gets more expensive. Um, and you might be able to find these for your industry. And it will just give you a really quick way of, of pointing towards um, what projects will, will be best right off the bat. Fantastic. Next up, we've got um, supplier switches. Uh, and, and this is quite low effort where, where all else is equal, although it will vary sector to sector uh, um, and input to input. You know, if you're in the construction business 
where you're building multi-million pound buildings with insurance and investors and warranties, then using a new type of cement is is pretty risky because that insurer has never used it before. It's not they don't know if it's going to fall apart in five years. Um, so you have to think about what your inputs are um, and what sector you operate in. Um, but all all else equal, um, this is the easiest thing to do. Um, it might have an increased cost that's associated to it. And that's where getting that internal cost of carbon is really helpful. Because as long as that increased cost is less than the cost you would pay to manage those emissions or the negative impact of those emissions, anyway, you're in the money and all's good. But you can also think about things like strategic benefits and risks. You know, this is all about giving your business an advantage. Um, it can be things like, you know, redundancy. You know, it, it, is there another supplier that can offer this fuel or this service in case this one goes out of business or retires tomorrow? Um, how robust is this supply chain? You know, does it all depend on one shipment going through the Suez Canal at exactly the right time? If so, we know what can go wrong there. Um, but also it can possibly require changes to your processes and your production schedules. Um, and it, this should really be part of ongoing negotiations in order to reduce the emissions of your, your whole supply chain. Um, the final thing to say is, is that local doesn't always mean better. Um, and that's particularly the case with things like food. Um, if you're raising uh, lambs in the UK in a heated barn uh, versus in New Zealand, where it's perhaps sunnier, uh, and you don't need to heat that barn, it actually might be lower emissions to get your lamb for your restaurant from New Zealand uh, than it would be for it to travel uh, 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 less distance, but actually use more energy over the life cycle of, of that product. Um, so really, it's, you have to consider all sources of supplier emissions um, from the kind of buildings and the processes that are used, not just the kind of transport and, and what the employees do. But also, in, um, all said and done, supply switch is a really easy way of reducing your um, scope three emissions. You can also look, instead of looking upstream at what you buy, um, look downstream at, at what you sell and how you sell it. People often forget that downstream emissions are the responsibility of the business. Um, and there have been some very effective marketing campaigns from, from the like of, of Coca-Cola and such to convince us otherwise that actually it's the consumer's responsibility to address those emissions. But often they're baked into your, your product to begin with. Um, so here we want to be thinking about the, the big R words, such as repair, reuse, um, reclaiming materials, um, and recycling last, last and pretty much least. Um, all those emissions are embedded in those products um, and in the waste that, that is generated as those products are being made. Um, and so actually, you can really get a, a, um, a competitive advantage by addressing those emissions within those products. Uh, we want to think about things like getting less variability in your input materials, um, making things more consistent, um, making sure that you generate less waste and, and therefore less uh, ESG impact. You know, if, if you've got, um, you're constantly filling up the local landfill, people care about that. Um, and it can also uh, turn into lower input costs and, and lower amounts of wastage, um, particularly if you're doing things like recycling or, or reclaiming your own products. You know that that chip is the right type of chip um, or, or you know that that leg is going to fit on the next table as long as it works. Um, so thinking about uh, 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 these things are really key. And often if you want to explore these concepts, so looking using search terms like circular economy or circular product, will bring you towards uh, uh, methods at which you can address these downstream emissions. Um, the final thing to say is that, that where, where these things aren't under your control, it's a great excuse to start uh, a dialogue with that stakeholder. Um, and that actually the downstream life cycle touches on so many aspects um, of, of ESG from you know, how, how um, consumers feel using your products um, to what kind of practices it's involved with. You know, if, if a phone is treated as a, a disposable uh, a, a piece of equipment, um, that becomes part of the meaning of that phone and the practices which that phone is involved with. And then inevitably, when it comes to getting rid of that phone, people only really know how to throw it away. Um, and so setting uh, uh, routes to, to more holistic interventions and, and improvements can really help um, your 
um, customers to understand that and, and to actually build better practices. So maybe you teach them, you know, how to, to clean the phone, how to, to, to bring it in, identify when it needs repair and take it to a local repair shop. And maybe you incentivize them for, um, you know, it, linking your supply chain back upon itself. Um, one example of this is, is you know, a, a manufacturer of, of high-end musical instruments. Uh, they'll often purchase back secondhand um, products that their customers decide that they no longer want. Now, that saves those products perhaps going to waste or, or losing some of their value, um, but it also helps that business to maintain the value of, of that product. They bring it back in, they update the specifications to, to the most recent version that they produce, and they sell it for a much higher mar uh, 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 markup than if it was being sold purely secondhand as a, a uh, kind of semi-waste product. Um, so really, this can help to improve your business, and it can help your consumers to understand um, that you are environmentally responsible um, and um, that there, there are better ways of, of doing things than, than simply disposing of things um, at the end of their life. So <laughs> those are all the aspects that we've covered. And I know it was quite a lot. So please do let me know if there's anything that you would like to, to go back. We've got another 10 minutes here. Um, so I'll open up the floor to questions, either on supply chain stuff or on um, anything ESG. Um, so yes, if you've got any questions, just stick your hand up or, or pop them in the chat now. Hello, hi. Hi there. Uh, yeah, I'm Ellie. I'm from uh, Let's See Who Is. Uh, I have a couple question on both section actually. So the first thing about the information asymmetry, I would like to ask like which care will be better because like you were saying we should start not to telling the business what they will not like, right? But in some cases, I think like I used to kind of like propose the negative impact of us, but align with how will we mitigate the impact of those negative, mm -hmm. of those negativity. Yeah, so like uh, in your thought, I just would like, would like to know your advice, like which care will we like fit well about not to tell or tell them with the solution? Sorry, so is, is that asking around, you know, um, how best can you can you tell whether it's, it's something that you do want to talk to the public about or? Yeah, so for example, if I would like to propose one idea that have some negative impact. Yeah, so in, in which case I should tell them, okay, that is this negative impact, but we know how to mitigate it. And if we can successfully mitigate that, it's gonna, you know, like, uh, yeah, like it's gonna remove all the barrier on this idea or on this uh, supply chain or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but in some case, I just think we might need to avoid not to not to let the audience know. Yeah, so in your thought, do you think which kind of business that we should go for each case? Yeah, so I think often, often if you're a, a kind of business to business, uh, if you're operating in a business to business sector, um, then raising solutions that, that aren't perfect can actually be quite advantageous you know uh, often you're facing a dilemma and not a problem so you know a problem has a, a singular solution and you just need to find it whereas often dilemmas are actually a choice between two solutions both of which have some negative aspects to them yeah. um and the other thing is is i would say is that you know um every every intervention carries some level of risk um, and actually what investors and the the public and stakeholders get kind of turned off about is is when you're you just don't know mm. so so risk is in in my mind is much more acceptable than uncertainty uncertainty is you know um we're going to build this new road and it's it's probably gonna um we might make some species extinct, but we're not really sure we'll find out. Mm. Whereas, you know, risk is, you know, uh, we think that there's going to be a 30% reduction in the number of X, Y, and Zs. And mm. so here's what we need to do to, to make up for that. Um, and so in in um, more technical sectors or, or tech sectors where there's quite a good understanding of, of what your business does and what the risks are, speaking about that risk is is almost always advantageous. 
yeah. because it just shows to them that you understand that and that you're taking it into consideration and it's part of your strategy and hopefully like you say if there's something you can do to mitigate that mm. then actually that's the best solution you say you know that this is a good thing but it has some negative impacts with a bit of work we can mitigate those negative impacts and therefore we know that it's going to be positive overall um the final thing i'd say on this is that companies very rarely talk about the impact of not doing anything you know if every company went out there and wrote about the 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 impact of not taking action on climate change people would read their impact reports and think this is crazy why aren't you doing something and yeah. um, so often often these things are couched in terms of you know one form of action or another form of action um but if both of those forms of action are, are better than doing nothing, then you should definitely proceed with one. Mm -hmm. um, so did that kind of help answer the question? Yeah, 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 that uh, a perfect answer, actually. And I really uh, agree with that. Like a lot of people just overlook the impact of like what would happen if you're not doing anything, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a, another question on the supply cool. chain emission in like three scope that you have uh, present. Yeah, so I just have a question, like in case if a different business have their own share asset or share infrastructure, for example, if they have kind of like share renewable energy asset or hydrogen generation as asset, will that be considered as scope one or scope three? Yeah, so it all, it all depends on how that sharing arrangement is set up. Um, but usually the best way to think about it is in terms of, of operational control. So if I have a, um, a gas turbine um, and we both invested in it, and so we kind of own it 50-50%, um, but I'm the person who operates it and, and decides what type of gas feeds into that, um, then it would be wrong of me to put my natural gas emissions in as a scope three because I don't solely own that asset because I have a, effective full operational control over that. Um, that is, those are my emissions because I am the one who's responsible for changing the supply of gas from natural gas to renewable biogas, for example. Um, so another example I've come across recently was a port operator who operated a, a ferry line. They leased the ferries um, and they had that whole uh, 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 um, part of the business outsourced. And so they were they were saying that it was scope three and therefore, eh, well, you know, our scope one and two emissions are actually really low. Um, but actually because they the, the the leasing of that ferry was solely for the the benefit of that, that institution, um, it wasn't being shared with any other company those ferries weren't going off and doing different ferry routes on a weekend all the time it was spent operating for the benefit of this company and so when they actually realized that those scope three emissions and the fuels that were being burnt in that ferry became scope one emissions their scope one category quadrupled in size um, so really that's the way to think about it is is who has operational control of this and who has the ability to improve it um, and if the answer is both of you, then that's where you'd say, OK, let's split these 50-50. Or you'd look at the contract and see who has those kind of schedules involved. Um, it might be, for example, that they say, well, that's fine. We can burn you know, biogas instead of natural gas in this gas turbine. But you're going to have to pay an extra two pence per kilowatt hour to pay for that. Um, you know, that's, that's where you start to get to the kind of root of those conversations. Um, and get an idea around, you know, um, how best to address those. The reason why people like Scope 3 is because no one looked at it for the most part. It's much more complex for, for a, 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 a member of the public to go and look at. And so often they'll kind of hide things in Scope 3, knowing that mm. people assume they don't have control or will assume that it's not their problem at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. So then it's going to be the same case with the downstream emission, right? because we are not be able to control the customer behavior or how they're gonna I know, like, uh, emit the product that we're launching. So it's just gonna be in a scope tree because it's not under our control. Is that- Yeah, uh, so, so but the, the, if, you, if you've got a product that goes to waste, the emissions from the, the garbage truck, the rubbish truck that comes in and collects that probably wouldn't be your emissions. 
But if it's a plastic product that could have been made out of, of uh, uh, um, bioplastic, then the actual emissions embedded within that product itself would be counted, especially if it's a non-recyclable product, because then you've locked those emissions in um, and there is no choice further down to, to actually change that plastic to, to be bioplastic, if that makes sense. Mm, okay. Yeah, so in case if your plastic is a poor quality that emit a lot of carbon when it be like when it be supplied to like end user, you not you, you need to respond for that because it's like the the material within your own product. But if exactly. it's like yeah, if it's like the downstream or like the process that support your transportation or your distribution that's not on your control. Yeah, and, and sometimes it, these things are often framed about the ownership of the problem rather than the ownership of the solution. So, you know, a lot of Tesco's now you can bring back your soft film plastics and they will recycle those. Now, when they recycle those, they take that off their emissions at the end of the day because they've taken a problem that they're partly responsible for and generated a solution that they're wholly responsible for. <coughs> so when people use that <coughs> solution, they can effectively account for the impact of that and claim it as their own. Um, so often that's the way to think about these things in terms of, of the best form of action. Is there a solution for this that I can own? And if the answer is no in every like a, a, a facet of the problem, then that might not be your problem to begin with. Um, but if there is something that you could do, then some of that problem sits with yourself, likely. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's all my question. But thank you so much. That's so very useful. No, no worries. Um, have we got any more for any more? I know that we're ooh, we're up at time. What do you think, Alan? I think if we've got them, let's take them. But um, I don't know if we're going to have any more. Oh, no, just really ask question if, if Jay, can. Jay's Jay. got his mic off, so go for it, Jay. Yeah. Jay Dunham at Borgen Overstrom. Um, we installed a bunch of solar panels here at our factory. Yeah. Um, number of years ago and at that time there was a great rebate if we pumped the whole load of it back into the grid um, mm -hmm. so I think it's something like 48 percent of what we yeah. produce goes back into the grid we produce much more than we actually use as a company mm -hmm. um, in our when we've been calculating our kind of scope one etc we've only been kind of calculating what we actually use ourselves yeah um, because we were advised that we don't, we can't actually record the overall because half of that goes back into the grid. Um, is there any, is there anywhere I can record that somewhere as kind of an offset? Um, yeah, yeah. Know, no, what's totally. your thoughts? Um, so you know, if if that electricity is that electricity is effectively dis displacing uh, um, other electricity that's consumed on the grid, so some of that comes from from fossil fuel so what the uk government does is it is it publishes um what they call fuel mix statistics or, 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 or grid emission statistics um and so what you would do is you would take the amount of um electricity that you're producing and exporting to the grid um and you would say okay here's my emissions for that and that's probably going to be zero or close to negligible depending on how it's been accounted for because it's a renewable source and then you'd say, okay, well, what were the emissions from, you know, if that, that same 10,000 kilowatt hours were produced by the rest of the grid, which includes some fossil fuels, some renewables, um, and then you'll get a difference in that figure. So, you know, what are the emissions per kilowatt hour? And then you just times that by the amount that you've exported. Um, and that effectively uh, 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 is the, the amount of carbon that's been saved from everyone else consuming your electricity. Um, now, you can also, if you wanted to sell though that greenness as, you know, get it certified and, and sell it, um, or depending on if, if it's being purchased by a larger company, a single company, sometimes there, there will be a, 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 that will be part of the contract. So they're not just buying your power, they're also buying your power and its low carbon attributes. Okay. Um, but if it's just a general uh, fit kind of feed-in tariff or small export guarantee payment, um, that, that that's just for the power itself um, and those attributes you can do with those as you wish either sell them or claim them yourselves um, or whatever um, the other thing to consider sometimes is that if you're uh, able to use that to offset some of your own emissions from another source that that can be more kind of carbon effective 
overall, but it really depends where those emissions were coming from to begin with. You know, if you live in a fairly green part of the, the UK grid system, like really close to some, some wind turbines, actually the, the, the generation that you're consuming will probably be lower carbon. Whereas if you're, you know, having to burn diesel every three months, um, then maybe actually taking, getting a battery and storing some of that access, excess power would, would be better for carbon, uh, you know, uh, in the long run. Thank you. Fantastic. That's helpful. Lovely. Um, well, what I'll do is I'll flash my um, <laughs> email address up on the screen. I um, was worried where that will go. Um, and, you know, if you've got any further questions, you can drop us a line at any point. Um, and yes, great to, great to speak to you all today. Thank you, Connor. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that session. Um, I learned things. It's always good to learn things. So thank you, Connor. Uh, like I said, this is the last of um, our, our webinars. There won't be any more, but they are all going up on our website. Uh, Julia will send you details of this recording and where you can find um, the presentational content early next week. So um, we will get that out to you shortly. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, enjoy your weekends when they start. Uh, I hope it doesn't rain too much on you wherever you are, but it's very wet here. So um, thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good one. Bye, Fa.